Hi, this is Greg from Structure Toolkit. In this video, we're going through the design of a reinforced concrete pad footing that is supporting a concrete column. We can design a pad footing by using the pad footing module from the desktop. This design module allows us to perform design checks against bending, shear and punching shear for both reinforced and unreinforced concrete, along with looking at soil bearing underneath the footing. The supported column can be rectangular or circular and be positioned with two-way eccentricity. Bearing and pad moment and shear will also calculate accordingly based on the eccentricity of the column. Note that the column force inputs are axial only, and so if you want to look at applied moments onto a pad footing, you'll either want to look at a post footing or eccentric pad design. Overturning design is also only covered by these modules. We've done videos on both of these previously, we'll include links to them in the description. For our example in this video, we'll be looking at a 300mm square concrete column that sits at the corner of the site boundary with a 300mm clear offset in each direction to the face of the column. Our column applies an axial load of 50 kN dead and 100 kN alive. From a soil report for the site, we get a bearing capacity of 150 kPa at 450 depth and 200 kPa at 600 depth. Based on this, we'll be trying to work out our pad size and also reinforcement. So we'll start by opening up a pad footing module. This module shares some similarities with the concrete member and eccentric pad module. And so if you've used either of those before, you will probably be familiar with some of the calculations and designs performed here. We'll go through each of our inputs and talk about the different design checks as we get to them. We'll be using a concrete strength of 32 MPa. For now, we'll put in a tentative 900 mm square pad. As this will set our column central over our footing and will be a good starting point. We'll then start at our smaller depth size of 450. Next, we have some options for where we'll design the moment in the footing at. AS3600 has some guidance on a possible location in section 6.9 for idealized frame methods of analysis. If we imagine our pad footing model upside down with the column as the support, our footing as the slab and the bearing underneath as our load, we could look at applying clause 6.9.2 where it states that a maximum negative moment in a floor may be taken at 0.7 times the support width from the center line of the support, or in other words, typically half the support times 0.7. Alternatively, we could take the moment at the face of the column or at the center line. For our case, we will adopt the 0.7 ace up. Next, we have our method of bearing analysis. Elastic, which will be the focus of this video, determines the varying pressure distribution underneath the pad based on the eccentricity of our applied load in both directions. We'll look at this in a bit more detail when we get to the calculations section of this module. The second method is the plastic method, which takes the calculated eccentricity of the loads and assumes that the load is distributed evenly over an area that sets the point of eccentricity at the center of this area. We spoke about this in more detail in the masonry wall and footing design video, so check that out as needed. It's worth noting here that the models used here are based on a rigid rectangular spread footing with linear soiled pressure distribution underneath its base. We then have our column inputs, which are both 300. We also have the option for a circular column here, where we would set the second input as zero. And the first input then becomes the diameter. With our geometry done, we can move on to our loads. As discussed at the start, we have a dead load of 50 kilonewtons and a life of 100. Next is our eccentricities, which will be based on our footing geometry and the offset from the boundary. 
We'll be changing our pad size throughout our design, so although currently our column isn't eccentric, we want to make these inputs as a function of our size. These inputs are from the center of the pad. So as a function, our eccentricity in both ways will be the width or length on two, minus our column offset from the boundary of 300, and then minus half our column width to get to the center of the column. We input this into each cell and we can easily reference our length and width above by clicking on them when editing a cell input. For good measure, we'll then insert a comment. Another way to obtain the variable of a cell is to right click the cell you want the variable of and click the cell name selection to copy it to the clipboard. You can then paste it into any input with Ctrl V or right click paste while editing. For our footing density, which adds further bearing pressure underneath our pad, as we will be removing soil, which is then replaced with concrete, we'll be setting this as 6 kilonewtons per meters cubed, as this is the difference in density between concrete to a typical soil weight. Next, we'll set our bearing as 150 kPa for now, as this is our bearing for 450 depth. Finally, we then have our reinforcement. The first input allows us to set the footing as unreinforced, which will change the design checks below from reinforced to unreinforced. We'll go through each of these checks briefly in a moment. We then get other inputs for reinforcement layers, cover and ductility class. We'll leave all these options as default. As for the reinforcement itself, we'll first be trying to get a mesh to work such as SL82 or SL92. We'll tentatively select SL82 to start with. Now before we move on to looking at the bending and shear capacity checks, it will be worthwhile to first understand how the design shear and bending are calculated. Our bending and shear are calculated in the calculations tab below, so we'll move on to that. At the top of this tab, the total weight of our point load and pad self weight are calculated. We then have sections for both our elastic method and plastic method. In our elastic method, our overall eccentricity for both directions is determined. This is worked out by proportioning our point load's eccentricity against the centroid of the pad itself. Based on our total weight and eccentricities, we then have the calculated bearing pressure underneath our footing at each corner, along with the length of each edge that's under pressure. At the moment we can see our entire footing is bearing on the soil, with our bearing equal around the entire pad footing, which is what we would expect based on starting our footing with no eccentricities. Now if we were to go back to the design tab and change our pad size from 900 to say 1500 square, firstly we can see that our eccentricity has automatically changed. And we can see in the calculations tab that our calculations have changed and only a portion of our pad is now under bearing. As you can imagine, there can be infinite arrangements of bearing lengths and distributions around the pad based on our load and eccentricities. The equations for the bearing calculations are a complete analytical solution for linear soil pressure distribution under rigid rectangular spread footings, the reference for which can be found on the info tab. Based on these calculations, the bearing pressure distribution can be determined across the entire pad, which we can see in the table of results below. Where we have pressure values at different points along the footing referenced in the diagram above. These different points relate to the locations we will want to determine our design shear force and moment. For example, line B2O here represents a line along which we will want to determine our shear force, being a distance of dV from the face of the column as per clause 8.2.3.2. Our moment is then determined at 0.7 a sub along the line C to N, 
The diagram shows this at the face, however this position is adjusted depending on whether we are designing at the centre of the column, a distance of 0.7 asap away, or at the face, which is something we discussed earlier. The next part of our tab is then actually calculating our design bending and shear. As we have already worked out the bearing distribution underneath the entire pad in the calculations above, we can use this to then work out our bending and shear along a specific plane of the footing. For example, if we look at our point C to N again, we'll want to determine the moment about line CN based on the bearing pressure on the footing from the left. In simple terms, this would just be the volume of bearing pressure under the footing in this area multiplied by the centroid of the volume. As the self-weight of the footing will counteract this force, it will also need to be negated off this moment, but we'll talk about this more shortly. To work out what both the volume of pressure and the centroid is, the volume is divided up into small slices to approximate the varying pressure distributions volume and centroid in each direction. This same volume calculation is also used to determine the shear force. This process is then applied to four areas around the pad as shown in this table, with four different moments shown to the right. As mentioned before, these areas are slightly adjusted for position of moment calculation, being designated as LEXT and WEXT. We can see the calculation of this in the notes to the right, where we have our adjustment for 0.7 A sub. As we discussed, the self weight of the footing will counteract the bearing pressure shear and moment in the footing. As default, this reduction is conservatively multiplied by 0.9, as shown to the right. However, if you want to achieve an exact answer that results in equilibrium of forces along the footing, you will need to reduce it by the equivalent ultimate factor, as we are dealing with ultimate shear and moment. This is then the average load factor based on dead and live load forces. Based on the moment shown in our table here, we can then work out what our maximum moment will be in each direction. Currently these moments are based on the entire width or length of the footing, and not per metre. The resulting critical moments are then the maximum of each direction divided by their respective footing lengths. Do note that for highly eccentric footings, you will likely get high concentrations of moment near the edges of the footings due to the large variation of bearing pressure across the footing. This is not something this module considers. The shear forces below are then calculated in a similar way to the moments we have above, which are then converted into per metre length or width. Now that we understand how our moments and shear are calculated, we can look at the design checks that are performed. We'll go over each of them briefly. We may look at concrete bending and shear design, along with punching shear in their own videos in the future. For bending we have our reinforced capacity in both directions, being the typical bending capacity of a rectangular section. We can see the full formula over to the right. Unreinforced bending is then based on clause 20.4.2 being for plain concrete footings, where the bending capacity is taken as phi MUO using the characteristic flexural tensile strength. This ends up being phi FCT Z. An important thing to remember with the design of footings is that the depth of footing needs to be taken as 50 millimeters less in design than the actual depth. So in our case, our Z will be based on 400 rather than 450. As an interesting point, if we go back to the 2001 concrete standard, this 50 millimeter reduction is only required when cast against the soil. As we are designing for reinforced, we can see that our reinforced design check says applicable, with unreinforced saying not applicable. Next we have reinforced punch in shear, which comes from section 9.3 for strengths of slabs in shear. This check looks at shear failure locally around the support, or in our case, the column. Our punch in shear design force is based on the maximum bearing pressure underneath the pad, multiplied by the area of footing outside the punch in shear perimeter. 
With highly eccentric footings, this force will be conservative because the punching force is calculated based on the maximum ultimate bearing, which may not be representative of the varying bearing and resultant force under the column. The formula used for our design capacity here comes from clause 9.3.3, and it's worth noting that our column shape and size will affect the capacity, such as going from a rectangular to a circular column. Something to note is that if there is design moment transferred to the footing, then you'll need to use the punching shear module to account for this moment. Unreinforced punching shear comes from clause 20.4.3, and shares some similar variables to that of unreinforced. Finally, we have one-way shear, or shear failure that can occur across the width of the member. For our reinforced section, the concrete contribution to shear strength is calculated. Note that shear leaks are not considered in this module, and so you will need to use the concrete member design if you want to use leaks. Below we then have the unreinforced check, which comes from clause 20.4.3. Something we haven't yet mentioned is the distinction between two-way and one-way. AS 3600 doesn't outright state at what point does a slab transition from one-way to two-way, or vice versa. So what we can do instead is infer from the simplified method for two-way slabs in section 6.10 as to what the ratio may be. Based on table 6.10.3.2b, we can see that for a four edges discontinuous slab, the moment factor for the short span converges on WL squared on 8 after the longer span exceeds two times the shorter. Or in other words, once the moment ratio of both directions exceeds 0.049 on point 1. Have a look at our two-way slab design video for more information on this method of analysis. In our case, as our pad is currently symmetrical in size, our moment ratio is 1, so it is considered two-way. We can see this shown at the top of the design document. This will affect the requirement for leaks where the footing is 750mm or deeper and the footing is one-way, as per clause 8.2.1.6c. With all our design checks covered, we can move on to working out what our pad needs to be. Now, when we changed our footing size earlier, you may have noticed that it made our bearing pressure even higher. The reason for this is that although we have provided a bigger footing to help spread out the bearing pressure, we've also increased our eccentricity in both directions, which in turn will increase the concentrated bearing pressure at the corner of our footing based on our rigid footing bearing model. What you'll generally find for footing designs like this is that if you are critical for bearing, you will be better off trying to deepen the footing down to a higher bearing capacity or increasing the size without increasing the eccentricity. With that in mind, what we'll likely be better off doing is increasing our footing depth to 600 and starting again with our column central within the pad, so 900 millimeters squared. And at our 600 depth, we can take a bearing pressure of 200 kPa. We can see this now lets our bearing work. Another approach to dealing with eccentric footings is by using a tie beam with a counterweight that acts as a mechanism to balance out the overturning moments and bearing. This is something you can do within the eccentric pad module, but is beyond the scope of this video. Finally, we can look at our reinforcement again. We can see that currently our reinforcement is less than our minimum, and it's unlikely we'll be able to get any of the other meshes to meet this. So what we'll do instead is nominate N16 bars in both directions. To then stay within our minimum, we'll need to keep them at 200mm centers. And with that, our pad footing design is complete. That about then covers all you need to know to design a concrete pad footing in Structural Toolkit. Feel free to check out our website and our other videos for more tutorials and help with using this software. If you have any questions, please contact our support via email or by calling us. Thanks for watching.